I live in Oxford and uh, I'm struggling to explain why I'm here at Slatterley, except uh, Joe Sadler, who is the main theme of the talk that I'm going to give, really, uh, is the first English balloonist. He's the first English man to fly. I arguably the first Briton. Uh, and he comes from Oxford, uh, which is where I'm living. And so his story is such a, an interesting one in the sense that he was a man of had no education as far as I can work out. Uh, you know, uh, one might assume somebody coming from Oxford who achieves great things probably had a university background of some kind. He didn't. Uh, he was a pastry cook. Uh, and that's what really interested me initially. But then he has quite a few Irish associations, uh, as does his son. Uh, and so in 2017, I came here to Ireland and gave several talks about him. Uh, and the opportunity to come back, uh, both to talk a bit about him, but also uh, my realisation uh, that there were these, not just a couple of Edgeworth connections, but several, uh, made me realise that this was a, a great opportunity to uh, say a little bit more about uh, that aspect. So this is a completely new talk in a way. There's little bits that I have spoken about before, but most of it's uh, kind of uh, rejigged and recontrived so that, um, you know, it, it, it appeals hopefully uh, to a local Edgeworth Town audience. Um, now, I'm struggling a little bit because I don't know really how you, you, you are very knowledge. You, some of you may know lots and lots about uh, Mariah Edgeworth, uh, Richard Edgeworth and so on. Some of you may know very little. I'm assuming that the, the, the latter really, uh, which is my situation. I don't claim to be an expert on that, on the literary side. I do know a fair bit about ballooning. Anyway, let's, uh, let's continue. Um, and we'll get to the Dublin 1812. That's the key to the, the talk, really. That's where uh, the Edgeworth family and James Sadler really coincide, and we'll get to that in due course. Broad, broadly chronological, we'll go. Uh, now, the maps may, you may struggle a little bit with. I'm sorry about that. It doesn't matter too much, in a sense. And uh, I have brought uh, a handy ruler with me just uh, to help you. So this is... Uh, Oxfordshire in the 1790s. So I'm going to start there and then we'll come over to uh, Ireland uh, shortly. Uh, the reason I'm starting in Oxfordshire uh, and indeed Oxford is because uh, that is where uh, Richard Edgeworth, uh, Mariah's father, uh, was sent, let's say, uh, to study at Christchurch, I'm uh, sorry, at Corpus Christi, I beg your pardon, uh, in 1761. Uh, Again, I, I, I hope I'm not just telling you stuff you all already know, but the reason that he was sent to uh, Corpus Christi was because um, uh, Richard Edgeworth's father had a good friend called Paul Ellers, uh, with whom he had studied law in London. And Ellers, it's quite a funny story, I think, as to how Ellers came to be the lord of the manor. We've been just hearing about big houses, so there's a connection here, in a sense. Uh, the big house, if you like, uh, in Oxfordshire that Paul Ellers married into was uh, where the Blue Arrow is shown there. It's a, you know, it's a fair distance. I suppose that's about 20 miles, that's a bit more actually from Oxford here. Um, uh, right. Um, and... Because of that, because the Ellis family were there, uh, Richard uh, Edgeworth was in Oxford, he was, his, his sort of tuition, in a sense, his moral tuition, let's call it, was entrusted to Paul Ellis. And so Edgeworth found himself at this village of Black Orton, where the um, Ellis family were the, the lords of the manor, if you like, uh, on many occasions. Found himself attracted to one of the several daughters, still Ellis, who lived there, uh, Anna Maria, uh, and they eloped, and both underage, uh, not legally allowed to marry, so went to Scotland where you could get married, as you're probably well aware, uh, married, but that was not legally binding, it didn't so satisfy either parents, 
And so uh, they came back here to uh, the local church of St Mary's Blackburn to uh, get married for a second time, and that's on the 21st of February 1764. Mm. Oops, sorry. Uh, there's a bit of a delay, I think, in there. Um, I think possibly even people who have studied Edgeworth in great detail may not have seen this. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but here is the, the written record in the church parish register of that second marriage. And I thought it was quite interesting, really, that um, she has signed herself, well, there, as Anna Marie Edgeworth, even though this is the marriage, she's signing herself as Edgeworth already. Uh, then late Ellers, well, you know, she's really proud of that. She's already got married. Uh, she's not calling herself Anna Maria Ellers, Mary Richard Lovell Edgeworth. She's already calling herself Edgeworth. So that's what you see in this, you know, therefore slightly unusual um, record of a marriage, I would uh, say to you. And there's uh, an image of her, uh, Richard uh, Lovell Edgeworth's first of four wives, of course. Right, again, uh, you probably, this will, uh, don't worry about the detail. This is a Christchurch. One of the beauties of um, studying anything to do with Oxford and indeed many other parts of uh, the world, actually, uh, is that the colleges there are great um, curators of many, many different sorts of records. Uh, this particular estate uh, was historically land belonging to Christchurch. Uh, one of the two wealthier Scotsman colleges. And so Christchurch has a number of uh, documents and archives that you won't find even in the Bodley Library or uh, the, uh, uh, the archives here in Ireland. And so this is an estate map of Blackburton from 1772. And the red there is the house, Borton Abbots or Borton Place. Uh, and the, the, the wealth came from the Hungerford family. And this is the arms of the Hungerford family, which uh, have been taken away from uh, that demolished house. We're hearing just in that film, weren't we, about the big houses, how a number of them were destroyed. Um, that's not the case with Borton Place. It doesn't stand any longer, but it was just um, a lack of uh, care, I think. Um, Paul Ellis just really didn't understand how to uh, operate a large country mansion of that kind. It started to deteriorate, it lost money and so on. And so uh, the whole thing got demolished. But this little bit, the coat of arms was saved and is uh, still in a, a building just close to the parish church. Now, uh, I went there purely for this talk. I've never been to Blackburn before, but I went there a couple of weeks ago. And to get there, uh, you come from a place called Carterton, which is up here, up here to the north. Uh, and to get there, what you do is you walk around at Broy's Norton Air Base. I'm sorry, uh, it's just... Oh, okay, I need to get, get a bit closer, I think. I just move back slightly. Um, so, lo and behold, that's, that's a snap I took uh, a week or so ago. Uh, there was quite a lot of activity, and I'm beginning to think now this is possibly because of Sudan, actually. How okay, appropriate, in a way, that just on the edge of Paul Ellers' um, um, uh, former estate is this now, this uh, modern airbase, which, as I'm giving a talk about uh, hot air balloons mainly, um, does lead me rather nicely uh, back in time, but to the main theme of my talk. So, um, I think it's helpful to uh, just put this into context. Uh, I'm slightly nervous that the, uh, you know, sometimes when you plug a uh, USB into a different machine, then the, uh, the text and so on gets a little distorted, which I can see from this image it has. So uh, let's carry on and hope that uh, there's not too much corruption. Basically, this is what's happening in France. This is the origin of flight, if you like. You've seen a picture I took a couple of weeks ago, which is modern flight. Uh, here we have the very, very beginnings with uh, the Montgolfier, the French Montgolfier brothers. Uh, first, uh, a simple experiment just to prove that a kind of a bonfire will actually uh, fill a, a canvas sack and push it upwards. 
Uh, and then in September 1783, they uh, moved fairly rapidly, really, to test it with a, a cargo of living animals, uh, a, a duck, a sheep, and a cockerel. You know, that's a substantial payload, really, for a first attempt at any sentient beings uh, going into the air. And then, you know, the, the technology moved really, really rapidly because um, then November, so bear in mind, it started in June. By November that year, two men were going up in a balloon, and that's what we're looking at here. Um, and then, uh, so the, the, but that's the Montgolfier idea. That's, that's just simply a huge kind of um, furnace of, of, of smoke, essentially, hot, literally hot air, which is filling the, uh, the globe, or uh, as the French called it, uh, it's, being, it's being restrained by the ropes there, and then you let the ropes go once it's filled and up it goes. And then only a couple of weeks after that, these two guys, uh, Charles and Robert, are using hydrogen. You know, this, it, this is such a, a new discovery. It's not even called hydrogen at this point, nor is oxygen. You know, they call it uh, uh, phlogisticated air was the title that it was given, hydrogen, uh, at this point in time. And just very briefly, uh, the reason that I've got uh, that they travelled using the hydrogen technique, 27 miles plus three miles, uh, is because the two of them went off, Charles and Robert, for 27 miles, in a really substantial distance for the first ever uh, hydrogen flight. Uh, the balloon landed, uh, Robert got out, and then, you know, suddenly the whole thing was that little bit lighter, and off went uh, Charles uh, for a second flight, rather to his surprise, if you get him direction, uh, simultaneously, therefore, being the first man ever to fly solo on that day. Um, and, well, he never did fly again. So, first of the people that will resonate if you know anything about the Edgeworth family, uh, and that's the, uh, the, person, the second person there, uh, Erasmus Darwin in green. There were a number of people in Britain just experimenting, just with the toy, sorry, toy balloons, essentially. Uh, 10 feet in diameter, five feet was uh, uh, Darwin's one uh, launched from Derby on that occasion. That's all through 1783. Um, and a point I would make, this is Darwin's illustration incidentally, of how you actually fill a balloon with logisticated air, um, iron filing, sulfuric acid, water uh, to purify it. It's quite a simple process, but to do enough of it uh, it's a very expensive process. Um, the point I'd perhaps you just, just quickly to make with this is, um, I think we have some Italian, do we have someone from Italy in the audience? Oh, you are here, sir. Yeah, so there's a couple of Italians who pop up in this um, uh, early history of ballooning, and San Bacari is one of them there, uh, who uh, dented British pride a little bit by being the first man to uh, launch an experimental balloon in Britain. As, as you can see there, November 1783. All of these people are highly educated, quite in contrast to James Sadler. Just make that point at this stage. Um, but let's just talk about Dinwiddie, because Dinwiddie, who was a Scot, um, he came to Ireland. So this is where, you know, we're getting a bit closer to home. We're getting um, a number of people experimenting here in this country, mainly in Dublin, but uh, Belfast as well. Uh, Dinwiddie then has had a little experiment in Waterford and Kilkenny. These are all just small balloons, just trying to prove the principle, like, you know, the Montgolfiers did in the first place. Uh, and that continued onwards uh, to the extent, indeed, that in 1792, Dinwiddie, you know, using his experience here in Ireland, I think, uh, then went off to China and demonstrated balloons there in China in 1792 as a trade mission. And that's a, a silhouette of James Dinwiddie, very highly educated individual from Scotland, as I say. Um, so that's. Mm. But here, um, this is the name many of you might have picked up on, I don't know, perhaps you haven't. Uh, it's not a topic that anybody seems to have looked at in any good detail. There are very few books written about early aviation. But Richard Crosby was the first Irishman to fly. Uh, he started doing experiments, uh, again, you know, just the, the small uh, type of balloon, 
in uh, February 8, 1784, exactly the same time that James Sadler was doing uh, his experiments in Oxford. Uh, again, uh, using an animal to start with, uh, just to prove the principle. Um, and then ultimately, in early 1785, uh, he became the first man, Irish, first man to fly in Ireland, the first Irishman uh, from Ranley Gardens, which is here. And there is a, um, a statue in his um, honour there. And I'm rather, rather astonished, well, rather pleased, I suppose, in a way. That image on the left hand side is uh, also in Ranla, uh, or was, rather. I went there with Brian McMahon, who wrote a biography of Richard Crosby, which you can get if you're into this topic, Ascend or Die, it's called. Uh, and he showed me that mural, uh, a modernised version of Richard Crosby, which uh, no longer exists now. It's demolished. And even when I tried to Google that, I found no images at all. So that, even that, that picture there, uh, that I just happened to take when I was there in 2017 is a, a moment of history, really. The whole thing's uh, vanished now, I'm told. Um, it's rather sad. I think it's quite interesting and quite quirky. Anyway, that's a bit of a digression. But um, uh, the um, next person to try, well, yeah, this begins the story of the attempts to cross the Irish Sea. That was the great goal. That's what Crosby wanted to do when he first uh, went up in the balloon. Uh, it's what he had hoped to do again here in uh, 1785. That um, they say, uh, uh, he, he had launched a small fire balloon from my own house in the year 1786, which confirmed me in the opinion of the practicality. And then he says, um, because there's so many thatched houses in my neighbourhood, I desisted from making any further trials. Very sensible, I think, uh, probably. Uh, he also writes just in the next paragraph, he says uh, that he went to meet uh, the Mongolfier, or one of the Mongolfier brothers. Uh, uh, in, in 1802, so you know, some years after those first experiments, and he goes on. He describes how, uh, how, what a, what a pleasant experience it was to walk around with the Mongolfiers and uh, discuss various scientific matters. Right. Um, but let's get back to Oxford now. Uh, and George, so so you've seen those little those those variety of different experiments, including Erasmus Darwin. Uh, Crosby, Dimwiddy and so on were experimenting here in Ireland. Uh, Sadler himself did the same sort of thing as the Mongolfiers, just an experimental balloon. And then uh, dog, uh, dog and an unspecified animal a couple of uh, months later in May 1784. Uh, no, I have no idea how he understood how to do this. You know, as I say, he had virtually no education that I can find. Uh, and when you read the one or two letters that survive of this, the, you know, his writing is, is pretty fundamental, it's pretty basic, essentially. Uh, and this is, uh, this is Oxford. Uh, those of you, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but this is um, Magdalen College. This is the east of the city. This is the main high street here. Um, the Sadler's uh, shop, the best was there, just more or less opposite that college there. Uh, um, his pastry cook, and it was run by his father, essentially. He was the oldest son, uh, could easily have inherited had he wanted to just sit back, sit back and, you know, um, wait for his father to pass the business on to him or uh, to die. Uh, James Sadler, as the oldest son, could very easily have just, you know, settled into a very comfortable life. Uh, but a mundane one. And the reason why I think it uh, would be a comfortable life is because it was right here, right next to uh, a major coaching inn called the Angel Inn on Oxford High Street. It's right in the middle of the university quarter. Um, so he's guaranteed custom from all sorts. And then um, he didn't stay there very long, sadly. He went off and did other stuff. But let's just stick with um, Edois for the moment. There you are, a little fat Democrat. With considerable abilities is what how Richard Edgeworth described him in 1793. His manners are not polite, but he is sincere and candid. Uh, and the sort of great achievement, I think, of uh, what was called the Pneumatic Institute uh, is 
In other words, this idea of using gas to see if you could um, improve health through the uses of, the use of it. Um, so Humphrey Davy describes him, who who became you know who, who worked for uh, for Meadows in his younger days in Bristol. He said one of the most original men I ever saw, uncommonly short and fat, uh, with little elegance of manners, but his behaviour to me has been, however, particularly handsome. But um, in contrast, then, uh, what he says about uh, Beddoe's future and what bride, um, uh, Anna, Anna, Anna Edgeworth, is Mrs. Mrs. Beddoe, Mrs. Beddoe's is the reverse of Dr. Beddoe's, extremely cheerful, gay and witty. She's one of the most pleasing women I have ever met with, with a pleasing understanding and an excellent heart. And that's her. So, Sutter hasn't yet left to follow his own uh, separate career. He stayed a couple of years in Bristol and was the subject of one of Thomas Beddoe's experiments. Um, this is in a letter to Erasmus Darwin. It was published, you know, as a printed uh, publication that people could purchase if they wanted. And what he says there is, uh, I have myself felt the pulse of Mr. Sadler, the English aeronaut, while he has inspired for about a minute and a half at a time, pure hydrogen air from steam and iron. Uh, from a rate of 84 in a minute, it increased to 110 in 15 seconds and became soft and weak. Uh, well, no surprise, really. Um, even though Beddoes himself claims that despite all of that, um, uh, the effects were totally free from all irritating and positively deleterious properties. Um, yeah, you know, somebody has to be the first, I suppose. Somebody has to be experimented on. But um, I always like to think that expression on his face is exactly how it might have been when uh, Beddoes was experimenting by pumping uh, pure hydrogen into his lungs. Um, and it is hydrogen by now. So that name, that phlogisticated air, has been re renamed by the French by this time, hydrogen. Uh, Sadler himself then went off and built steam engines. He became the Barrett Master at Portsmouth and established uh, an engine, the first engine in any British naval sea dock uh, for a dry, in a dry dock. Uh, a chemist to the Navy invented guns, uh, invented cannon, uh, was going to have his cannon put on to the victory. Uh, however, uh, Nelson had to sail rapidly to fight uh, the Battle of Trafalgar, so those guns didn't actually ever go on to victory. But a really inventive mind, you know, um, never never satisfied, never uh, rested on his laurels, always looking for the next new thing. Um, and after a gap of 24 years of doing that sort of thing, he then came back to ballooning. That's unique. You know, nobody was doing that at all. And bear in mind, when he came back to ballooning here in 1810, we're still in the midst of the Napoleonic Wars, essentially. Uh, this is not a great time for celebrations, for great big events. Uh, people don't have a great deal of money in their pockets for a start, and that's what balloonists depended on. These were big entertainments where people needed to, uh, you know, the balloonists needed to sell tickets. Um, and what he had expressed an interest in doing long, long before was to become the first person to cross the Irish Sea. So 1812, um, he comes here to, uh, to Dublin. Uh, it's in the rotunda there that he uh, demonstrated his balloon. Now, this is not his balloon. This is not Dublin's. Uh, this is Lunardi again. This is the Italian uh, guy, the first man to fly in England or in Britain indeed, uh, demonstrating his balloon. And what you do is you, you inflate it in a big building, you invite people to come and look at it, they pay money to do that, and then you try and persuade them to buy a more expensive ticket for the actual balloon launch itself. Uh, so that's exactly what Sadler did. Uh, and here we get to the crux of the talk in a way, that, uh, wonderful letter written by Mariah Edgeworth uh, describing the balloon launch in 1812. Uh, and because of that, we know exactly which members of the family went along, and the ones that I've highlighted in 
uh, involved here. Uh, and as I said, I am, I'm, I'm sorry for those of you that can even read the text, but uh, yeah, it has got corrupted. That is what happens sometimes. Uh, I won't worry about identifying each of them, but it, it is clear from the image who's who. So Mariah went, uh, Richard himself went, uh, and then one, two, three, well, four, uh, four, well, four of the children went, although uh, William and uh, Smith were already in Dublin, so they sort of joined them there. So we know that because of the letter, which again, I, I went to look at the original on film in the uh, National Library. The launch was from here, uh, Belvedere House, um, it's now St. Patrick's College. I gave a talk there in 2017. Uh, and that's an image of that actual launch showing just uh, at the bottom image there all of the different casks of iron filings that you needed to generate enough power to get all of that distance, ideally, across the Irish Sea. It needed a lot of gas, of course, in order to try and achieve that. Um, so, um, it's a very long letter, uh, and these are just a, a little sort of flavour of how she captures the, the atmosphere of it. Most, almost every other description of a hot air balloon launch is by a journalist, and they tend to be a bit factual. They might mention the numbers of people, but they're more interested in any sort of uh, lords and ladies who are turning up, any aristocracy, a little bit about the um, sort of technical side of it. Uh, but then, you know, that's it, really. There's very little feel for the atmosphere itself. Uh, Mariah's letter just captures it absolutely perfectly. So I do um, 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 uh, re re transcribe quite a lot of it in my book uh, for that reason. So. Um, crowds in motion even at nine o'clock, the streets all, uh, streets tied, uh, sorry, in the streets, tide flowing all one way to Belvedere Gardens, such strings of carriages, such crowds of people on the road and on the race footpath, there was no stirring, uh, troops lined the road on each side, guard with officers at each entrance to prevent mischief because you needed to have a ticket, we were supposed to have a ticket to get in, and then Nothing I ever felt was equal to the pressure of the crowd. They closed over our little heads. I thought we must have been flattened and the breath squeezed out of our bodies. I really thought your children, this is a letter to her fourth mother, well, her third stepmother, um, I really thought your children would never see you again with all their bones whole, and I cannot tell you what I suffered for 10 minutes. But um, it's kind of all, you know, it's, it's all worthwhile, uh, ultimately, for the thrill of it. Uh, this is called um, uh, Prime, yeah, Prime Bang Up at Drum Condor, which is where the launch was from. Uh, it's a typical kind of uh, illustrative uh, cartoon about the sort of chaotic kind of situation that occurred in a number of these different uh, balloon launches, which attracted huge numbers of people, and um, very often they, they were delayed, you know, the balloons wouldn't actually go up at the time they were scheduled, and people got bored, and uh, of course, you know, you can understand the unrest. Over and over again, you see that, uh, and the, the, the caption here is somebody saying, if I could get at it, I'd make another hole in it, was uh, what somebody is saying. Uh, deep suspicion about them as well, you know, it's not, you know, not, a lot of people didn't even, you know, it would have been their first ever experience of seeing something like that. And in the very early days, they were, you know, people thought ghouls or uh, um, phantoms were sort of coming out of the sky to haunt them. So, um, then that's the build-up that Mariah describes, and then finally we get the balloon launch itself. Uh, the drum beats, the flag flies, balloon fall. Uh, and then off it goes, the balloon looked like a moon, black on one side, silver on the other, and like a dark bubble, then less and less. And now only a speck is seen. You know, you can stand there with her, can't you almost, and imagine all of that. Uh, and then she said, never did I feel the full merit of Darwin's description till there. That's Erasmus Darwin who's talking, uh, who, who describes balloon launches in his poem, The Botanic Garden. Uh, and then she also describes someone in the crowd, once the balloon is up in the air, saying, ah, musha, musha, God bless you, God be with you, uh, is what someone says. And, well, if God was with him, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't for quite the whole journey. Um, he ended up here in the sea. Uh, and 
and that was, you know, a gallant failure, let's call it. But um, family pride was restored uh, five years later when his youngest son, Wyndham, in 1817, did succeed in making that journey. And uh, I think I'm just going to talk about that. No, before we come to that one, I'm going to uh, first just uh, talk about the one in green here, uh, the one in November 1816. Uh, which he made with uh, someone from Belfast called Edmund Livingston. Uh, I think the, certainly the, 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 the sort of the adverts announced that their intention was in 1816 to cross the Irish Sea. Uh, it didn't go exactly to plan because they ended up going in entirely the opposite direction uh, here to the Bog of Allen. Um, and it's a rather touching and rather beautiful story, I think. Um, they did this, they, they, they launched quite late in the day, they landed in the Bog of Allen in almost pitch dark, probably like it is right now. Uh, you know, once they'd sort of sorted themselves out, it was dark, they had no idea which direction they were supposed to go, in a bog, <laughs> you know. Um, and they were only saved, so they say, because they heard in a very, very distant um, distance the uh, barking of a dog. And so they thought, oh, the dog, well, that's habitation. So they made for this dog, and eventually that was their salvation. You know, they found a small sort of crofter's cottage or whatever uh, that put up for the night. And they were so grateful to the dog that Wyndham Sadler um, adopted it and took it home and looked after it up in Liverpool, where he lived. Um, I gave a talk at Edenderry, which is the, um, the upward um, arrow there, that square, and they landed somewhere there, finally got out of here at Ballybrunt. So that's one of the bog maps. There's a whole series of beautiful maps like this that are drawn in 1810 and 1811. Um, and we'll come to one. Uh, we'll come, and our yeah, boss, Richard Edgeworth again, because he also uh, was a surveyor of bogs. Uh, he was commissioned by the bog commissioners uh, to do this local area. So here he is. Uh, there's the uh, district number seven, county of Longford. After the Bogs of Ireland, uh, they were uh, surveyed in 1810 by Richard Lovell Edgeworth. Um, and here's a, a second of those two maps. He only did two for this series, uh, and this is the one that has us right here. There's Edgeworth's town uh, right there. Uh, lovely things. Uh, at the Bodley Library, those ones uh, that I saw. A few years ago. Anyway, back to the successful crossing of the RSC by Wyndham Sadler. So this is five years after his father had failed. Um, that's the launch place in Portobello. It's now Collins Barracks. Uh, uh, in my, just as a sort of sideline interest, uh, Wyndham Sadler married someone called Catherine Richards, who was born in Ireland, uh, the daughter of someone called Thomas Richards of Dublin. I haven't managed to find out any more about them than that, but I'm sort of slightly optimistic that I might be able to do so one day. Um, so off they went, uh, off he went rather, uh, and where is his father? So here's a, a plan that accompanies his description, his published description of his the first, the first man ever to cross the RSC uh, in 1817. That's the map that was published with it. And the red is what his father did four years earlier, five years earlier. Um, so I'll step away from the microphone and just explain what happened. Uh, he went... Uh, and that's, that's the ending point there in the sea. So he, he was doing really well, but he went too far north, then got blown you know, south, then got blown in the right direction. Uh, this is James Sadler, and then got blown north again. So you know, the distance he covered was, was enormous, actually. It could so easily, with a kind of wind, actually landed in uh, Liverpool, which is what he wanted to do. Uh, whereas his son, in uh, 1817, simply got into his balloon, up it went, straight across, and straight down again in a very straight line. Just the lock of the draw, really, um, landed in Hollyhead in uh, Anglesey, uh, which counts as the very first uh, flight. So, as I say, he published his own uh, description. He also was instrumental, Wyndham Sadler was also instrumental in uh, enabling the very first woman to fly in Ireland. Her name was Miss Thompson, a friend 
I think probably English, but she might have been Irish as well. I can't identify her properly either. It's quite difficult. The women, unfortunately, in these early um, sequences of aerial objects, it's very difficult to find out anything about them, including the first English woman to fly, who was quite celebrated at, at the time. But to actually pin down exactly who she was has proved extremely difficult. I have a good go in my book, uh, in an appendix about her. Anyway, um, yeah, we've lost a lot of text on that one. Um, but anyway, uh, I think we won't worry too much about as well. But it was uh, this chap, Livingston, Edmund Livingston, who accompanied Miss Thompson on uh, that first uh, flight by any woman in Ireland in uh, 1817, uh, shortly before William Sadler made his first successful crossing. Uh, and uh, Livingston's quite interesting. He did a number of different uh, balloon launches. Uh, and I can't sort of conclude without mentioning this uh, wonderful woman. Um, not, a, well, yes, she, she, and she, she, what she can claim as a first is to be the first solo female to fly in Ireland. Uh, she was also the first uh, woman to fly solo in Britain, the first British woman, sorry, to fly solo. She did that in uh, 1826. So I have to say, when I first started looking into this topic, I had not expected women to be doing uh, stuff like that, to be uh, independently uh, going up in balloons. Passengers, yes, but independently, uh, relatively soon after they have been invented. It did rather surprise me. But Margaret Graham is an astonishing woman, I have to say. She did so many balloon launches, some of them with her husband, George, and so accident-prone, you know, she crashed into things, she fell out of the balloon, she ended up in the sea, she ended up, she got arrested for debt, um, goes on and on and on, uh, and uh, yet yeah, brought up a family of five or six children, um, very extraordinary. And so anyway, towards the end of her ballooning career, she came here to Ireland and made four launches from Dublin in 1853. Uh, the three of them on her own, uh, one of them uh, with her daughter, as I say, the first woman almost certainly to fly solo in Ireland. Uh, she did also have an Irish uh, companion with that balloon launch I've highlighted at the top there in 1837, uh, and Mr. Gregory, William Henry Gregory of Christchurch. Uh, that was the first ever balloon launch by a woman from Oxford, so it was quite a nice correlation there. Um, so, I'm going to just conclude now, uh, just by sort of summarising some of the more interesting uh, balloon launches that these two saddlers made, father and son. Uh, quite a few in, in Ireland, as you can see, by Brendan Sadler. Uh, all of these are um, described in, in greater or lesser detail in my book, uh, King of All Balloons. Uh, most, of the, most of the Irish ones were quite exciting for different reasons, so I think, you know, there's a fair bit in there. A little bit about the Edgeworths, but I know a lot more about their interconnections now. Uh, as you can see, they, they you know, they've travelled all over England uh, doing launches at different places, and, and Scotland indeed. So, um, that's just to try and whet your appetite a little bit for the book. Um, but I, can't sort of conclude any talk about James Sadler um, without bemoaning the fact that he's so little known, really. Uh, you know, a man of little education, not much charisma, I think, whereas most of the other balloonists had lots of good connections, they were very well educated, uh, they were you know, probably a bit, they probably could socialise a bit more easily than Sadler could. Sadler was a man of action, not a man of words or uh, conversation. You know, he got on with stuff and just achieved so much. But, you know, he's virtually forgotten. Uh, even in Oxford, there's, there's virtually no... Um, uh, well, you'll see in a moment. Um, he's not honoured in his home hometown hardly at all. Uh, but he's described as no better chemist or mechanic in the universe, yet he can hardly speak a word of grammar. You know, Thomas Beddoes would have agreed with that. Uh, Richard Edwards' um, son-in-law would have agreed with that, part, uh, that summary. Uh, our English adventurer is the first person who has been his own architect, engineer, chemist, and projector. In other words, you know, he understood the whole process. Most of the other balloonists needed some other sort of way to sort things. Uh, and other circumstances took place at Cambridge. Probably he would have made his fortune. Cambridge was much more 
uh, centered on the sciences than, uh, uh, than Oxford. So, um, I will just conclude uh, with a shameless advert for my book. And if I could just sort of slightly uh, give you an incentive, although in Britain I'm, we're selling on the ten pounds, but I believe the centre is offering uh, you saving up ten euros, uh, and none of it goes to me. You know, uh, all of the profit is going to the centre. So if you'd like a, a signed copy, uh, please uh, do go and see uh, Mary. Is it Mary uh, or whoever's at the desk? Um, anyway, um, I don't know if you have time for questions or if we've gone on too long and you all want to rush home. But um, I'm in your hands, really. Oh, I'm in Matt's hands, really, aren't I? Aren't I? Somebody, somebody rescue me. <laughs>